Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis, and this week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at Final Flight Outfitters, the family-owned outdoor store that has all the apparel and outdoor equipment you need for your next hunting or fishing trip. Visit finalflight.net for more information. Welcome to Real Foot Forward from Discovery Park of America, located up here in the corner of beautiful West Tennessee. Every day at our museum and heritage park, we inspire children and adults to see beyond. And each week, we do the same thing here on our podcast. In today's episode, Scott sits down with Lee Wolf Wilson who is the owner of the Jackson Escape Rooms in Jackson, Tennessee, and also the winner of Hunted. Hello, I'm Scott Williams, host of Real Foot Forward, where each week we celebrate our little section of the South as we explore the culture, the spirit, the accomplishments, and the heritage of our home here in West Tennessee. A jack of all trades, Lee Wolf Wilson has worked in the list is long, folks. He's worked in construction, photography, higher ed, junk hauling, and in a college ministry, and a whole lot more. But the real reason we have him on today's episode is his work in the area of adventure and escape as the creator of Jackson Escape Rooms, first of all. But then also, he was a winning contestant on the CBS reality show, Hunted. So welcome to the show today. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Moral of the story, I'm not good at keeping a job, and I'm pretty good at being bad. <laughs> apparently, apparently, and but you're um, good at not being caught. That's right, that's um, right. Fi- to, to your financial benefit at, yeah. at the end of the day, as, as we'll find out more about. Um, so we have a popular escape room at Discovery Park of America that's very popular that you contributed to and, and helped the team out there, so thank yeah, you for that. Yeah, that's right. Tail end, I got to jump in and consult, and uh, I was very impressed with what your team came up with. Thank you very much. They worked very hard on it, and it is incredible. I actually, tr- I, I escaped from it, but it was only because I told the guy, you know, he needed to give <laughs> you me some, want to keep your job. some <laughs> clues. Yeah, I needed some clues. Uh, Chris, Chris, um, the docent um, at Discovery Park of America, who who uh, helped me in the escape room, slipped me a couple of little extra hints. Yeah, it's all about the fun. You don't want somebody shut down. Absolutely. So I know that you... You know, you're from Austin, but you ended up in West Tennessee by way of Kentucky. So tell me a little bit about your path. Yeah, so I'm from the hometown of Keep Austin Weird and live music and grew up not really knowing how good I had it. <laughs> I mean, Austin, Texas is pretty spectacular. It's an incredible town. Yeah. yeah. And they've my, done a lot with music. Oh, a little bit. Yeah. You know, Stevie Ray Vaughan, a couple and of technology. other big names. Yeah, technology. I mean, Michael Dell's got a house there with a that's just composed of trampolines in one room. I mean, it's it's wild what happens in Austin. And um, yeah, I mean, my, my journey took me through uh, College Station and Texas A&M, which is its own little world. Uh, into Louisville, Kentucky, where I moved with my wife after we got married to go to seminary. And it's its own um, fun, interesting, uh, screw-loose kind of place, a lot like Austin. So the transition to Jackson, Tennessee was different. <laughs> and what, and what, what uh, first of all, you met your wife in Austin? I met her at Texas A&M. Okay. We were in college together. Okay. And mm-hmm. so then you guys moved. And then what brought you to Jackson? Well, you know, when you need a job, you need a job. And uh, at the time, I was um, a seminary student looking for work, ready to, to be outside of the seminary grind. Uh, and a good friend of mine happened to have a job at Union University and gave me a call and said, hey, why don't you come down and interview, and um, we'll see if you're a good fit. And I was like, well, we'll see if you're a good fit. <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready to be at a Christian college in Jackson, Tennessee. And uh, uh, But I was blown away uh, and incredibly impressed and um, loved the university and with time came to really fall in love with Jackson itself and all of West Tennessee. Yeah, it's it's an incredible area. A lot of people don't realize the music and the culture and the restaurants and, you know, um, it's definitely, um, but it's definitely different than Austin. It's got a different vibe, Um, but the whole area is incredible. All the hunting and fishing and everything you can do in West Tennessee. I mean, there's a a rich heritage and history and uh, a very 
optimistic future. So how long were you uh, working at Union before you started? Did you start doing escape rooms first? No, 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 no. So um, I worked at Union for about six years, and my primary work was in discipleship, investing in students and also in retention. Uh, and then that gave me the opportunity to, uh, to teach some classes. So I taught a class that was designed at helping a, a new student transition into Christian higher education, um, but also got to travel to Israel five times and teach New Testament with my seminary background, um, did some mentorship classes, and just like loved it, like loved my seven years there. Uh, but at the end of seven years, I was kind of coming up against that moment where it's like, okay, I need another degree to keep going. And I just didn't want to do that. Um, you know, I'm a, uh, a lover of all knowledge, uh, but didn't want to like keep digging and digging and digging and digging in that direction. And so um, I was just kind of at this stall out place, just wondering what's, what's the next thing. And all of the conventional paths were um, not really what I wanted to do. And so I was just kind of like waiting. And then suddenly my good friend, Jared Downhower, um, who is a puzzle nerd from way back, had heard about this idea of escape rooms. And so in March of 2015, we literally just said, okay, let's let's do this thing. We never played an escape room. We'd never been in an escape room. That was very early. In yeah, the, it in was. I mean, room escape rooms had only been around in the United States for a couple, two or three years at that point and were concentrated on the East Coast, West Coast, Chicago, like big cities. Um, there was one in Nashville at the time that was starting to develop and become pretty prominent in the scene. And uh, But no, we, we had no idea what we were doing. We had no business being in business. We just thought, man, we need to try something new. We need to mix it up. Let's do a little project. Maybe it will like reinvigorate you know, where we're currently at in life. And it just exploded. I mean, we call it the experiment gone horribly right. <laughs> uh, and turned from a one-week pop-up into a three-week pop-up into a second pop-up. And now we've had 65,000 people play in Jackson, Tennessee in the last four years. Wow. And the empire has grown out over Tennessee and Texas. And it's wild, completely so wild. So is there, is there like a uh, national organization of escape room owners? There are some conferences. And there's, uh, like everything else now, there's Facebook groups. And you they know, lock the doors and, go. and, and <laughs> yeah. not let yeah. you out. Yeah. And, yeah. Good luck, guys. <laughs> <laughs> How long does it take 200 people to get out of a conference hall? <laughs> well, it's a, I mean, escape rooms, for people who don't know much about escape rooms, and it's still relatively new. Why yeah, don't you get, most of our players have never played an yeah, escape room Yeah, why don't you tell, tell uh, the listeners a little bit about what an escape Probably room is? Probably the easiest way to understand it is um, you're signing up to play a room, and when you step into this room, it's going to feel a lot like a movie set. So there's going to be some kind of theme, some kind of story, but the goal really is to figure out the hidden secrets of that room, uh, put together the mystery and solve the riddles and puzzles in order to escape the room in 60 minutes or less. And so that's kind of what you're doing. But what it's doing for you is giving you a, a moment with people you care about, uh, an opportunity to really click with friends and, and figure out, you know, I, 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 I talk about it a lot of times as transcending the sum of your parts, you know, like, Everybody in the room is pretty smart, but if you put them together and you give them a challenge and they don't know the way forward, it's amazing what you can come up with to escape the room. So that's what you're, uh, what you're trying to accomplish. In an and a lot room. of teachers that bring their students to the escape room at Discovery oh, Board, man. they talk about how it really uses a lot of STEM principles, Absolutely. so science, technology, engineering, math, and it also teamwork. Yep. It's fun teamwork, to watch people communication, work together. Critical thinking skills, leadership. Um, my favorite thing about it is that an escape room is a lot of fun, but it's also a controlled stress environment where there's enough pressure applied that people are who they really are under stress. And so that is really enhances that, uh, that bonding, that really enhances that team building because you're not, you're not the best version of yourself which you can be in a lot of activities, you're like who you really are, and that exposes some stuff and allows you to have some, um, some really great conversations to unpack later about, you know, when you hit stress, do you shut down or do you talk nervously and like crowd out the mental space that everybody's in? And it's really satisfying to, to, to do those things and have those conversations. Yeah, that's excellent. So you were in the escape room world, you were jamming along, everything was going <laughs> great, and then you open an email. Yeah, yeah, here I am just locking people in rooms for fun, having a good old time, and then I get a, a, an email out of the blue 
from one of the casting directors of CBS reality shows like Survivor and Amazing Race. And you would think that after years and years and years of doing this, that she would know that when you send an email, I mean, you should like make something about it official. <laughs> but instead, it was just subject line TV show <laughs> from a Gmail account. And I'm sitting there reading this going, so there's this new show, it's called Hunted. I'd be a fugitive on TV and I'm supposed to like click on this link to find out more. Like <laughs> this sounds like the start of a story where oh, you end yeah. up like in a bathtub yeah, packed with ice with your kidneys gone or, or something. Or they want you, know? you to write a check. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It sounds yeah. crazy. So I deleted it and then I just got to thinking about it and I was like, well, I bet I can verify that that's a real thing. And so I did some research and found out and like, no, it was legit. Like there's really a CBS show that's coming out where they're going to pull together nine teams of two uh, and just set them loose as fugitives in the United States of America. And this lady wants me to be on this show. How could I not at least have a phone call? Now how did and she so, How did she find you? Do you have Do you know? So where? she had. Um, she's from Pittsburgh. Her name is uh, is Ellen Barham Davis. She's amazing. She's a wonderful human being. Um, lives in Pittsburgh and had played an escape room in Pittsburgh and, and walked out and you know she's trying to cast for the show and you know the concept for the show is can everyday ordinary people escape what ended up being a hundred thousand square foot area uh, and and you know get away from the authorities and so she thought I wonder how the mind of somebody who creates a much smaller scale experience in des design to like trap people and get them stuck in there. Uh, I wonder how that would translate into this world of fugitive life. And so she was focused on doing her uh, recruiting from the Southeast, started digging around on different websites, and she just really liked the way that we presented ourselves as, um, as what we are. I mean, small business owners, a small creative team, we create all of our own content, and uh, she wanted to, to tap into that for the show. And so uh, it's pretty intense. Um, yeah. The yeah. the um, I don't. I'm going to find out if actually living it was in, as intense <laughs> as what we saw at home. Um, here's a real little short clip of the intro that talks a little bit about who was chasing you. So you had um, CIA, Navy SEALs, U.S. Marshals. You know, it, from that clip we just heard, it was pretty intense. What was it like on the other side? So we had no idea who we were cha who was chasing us. We just knew that whoever they were, they knew what we were doing, or they knew what they were doing, hopefully not what we were doing, and we had no clue what we were doing. So it, it just, man, it is, it is such a mind game because no matter where you are those 28 days, you are always assuming that around the other corner, just on the other side of the highway, you know, behind those trees, the hunters have to be there. Uh, because that's the only way that you can keep your edge. And you don't. Do you know what's going on with all the other people that are being? Oh hunted? no, you're completely in the dark. So you are yeah. completely. So alone. it was. I mean, for 28 days, it's me and Hilmar. We have a, a team of six that's our camera crew, following us everywhere, documenting everything. And did you get to you, know them, or did they become yeah. friends? Well, as well, that was. And this, I'm not necessarily supposed to talk about this, but that was one of the key parts of our strategy: is that we wanted that group of people to um, be more excited about what we're doing than anything that they'd ever been involved with in their entire careers. Because they had to, I mean, they had to be professional and they were professional, but they had choices that they had to make. And those choices could either be slow and drawn out to like fully satisfy every desire that their bosses may have to capture every angle and, you know, all of these different kind of nuanced things. Or they could do what they needed to do and be fast and efficient, and we could keep moving. And that's what we needed them to do. We yeah, needed I'm always them to fascinated by the camera people and the people you know behind on all the reality shows. Yeah. I mean, they are. They, we could talk. We have a whole show about them. I mean, they are some of the most fascinating <laughs> people. Oh, yeah. The yeah. things that they've seen, the things that they've been involved with. I mean, our. Our head co camera operator was the one holding the camera in uh, Jessica Simpson's famous famous moment where she's like "Chicken of the Sea" that like kind of started the whole uh, uh, viral um, you know reality show thing. So they just had been involved in all these big TV moments, and here they are, you know, documenting us just running from the cops, basically. Yeah, I'm always more fascinated by the behind-the-scenes folks yeah. that are just sort of mellow and chill as whatever's unfolding in front, you know, they're just professionals, and they, yep. they've seen it all. Um, so tell me about Hilmar. <laughs> so Hilmar is my best friend. 
Uh, Hilmar and I may, met in a very unique way. Um, when I when I moved from Louisville, Kentucky to Jackson, Tennessee to work at Union, it was two weeks to the day before the big F4 tornado rolled through and mowed down half of campus. Um, and he was a student when that happened. And uh, we kind of met in the aftermath. You know, we were doing disaster recovery stuff. He was a pretty prominent student leader with some connections to some of the university leadership. And so he was still around when most students were sent home. So we just kind of developed a friendship. Um, and I found out that because of the tornado, he was homeless, didn't have a place to stay. And my wife and I extended an invite for him to move in with us. Uh, and so we became incredibly close friends through the experience of, uh, of the trauma of the tornado and the exhaustion of like tornado relief, uh, but just getting to live together as well. And was he, was he working in the escape room business with no, you? No, no. So he, um, he's a lot like me in the sense that he has a very meandering path to what he's doing now. At the time, uh, he had just come out of a career in fashion design and was working in technology, uh, particularly technology that focused on social media. And so he was very familiar with how technology is used to like identify and create networks, which is understanding how that aspects of technology comes into play is one of the most important things to figuring out how to outsmart the authorities. Because what they look for is a money trail and a relationship trail are their primary avenues to capturing you. And if you know how they piece those networks together, then you can deconstruct those networks. And Hilmar played a huge role in helping to lead the way and us breaking down our networks and making sure that everybody that we stayed with there had no relationship to each other and no way of tracking and connecting that person to us through Facebook and LinkedIn and all of these other uh, technologies that are out there. And so what were you what were you given? I, kn- I know that they come to you and say <laughs> you're on the run and you yeah. take off. Did you know that was coming? No. Or, so that was <laughs> no, just man. out of nowhere. No. When you when you see uh, the camera approaching me uh, in the very first scene where Hillmeyer and uh, Hillmar and I are part of the show, I am completely shocked. I mean, we knew that there was going to be a three-day window where at some point we were going to um, start the run. But but we really thought that day we were going to pick up Hillmar and go to the zoo and just hang out as a family. Uh, they did an amazing job of tricking us into thinking that we were going to start running the next day, basically. And so I was shocked. I mean, it was like one of those, there's a camera in your face. All I'm thinking is... Um, now I'm on TV. I probably should not say any bad words. Hillmar, <laughs> <laughs> we gotta go, man. <laughs> and so, and so, you just and how long? How long? When you when you left and you said goodbye to your wife, yeah. best case scenario, if you were gonna win, how long were you gonna be gone? Yeah, the plan was that I was not going to talk to her even one time in 28 days. Wow. She was going to run our businesses and run our life and take care of the kids. And I was going to do this thing that was a once in a lifetime opportunity, um, you know, to, to win a quarter of a million dollars, but just a once in a lifetime experience. And that's something that my wife and I really value for each other. So I've, I've made sacrifices in the past to free her up to, to train for the Boston Marathon. And, you know, as a mother of two, she ran cross country for Union University. And, you know, there were sacrifices that were made, but, man, you can't, you can, I couldn't pass that up for her. And likewise, you know, it put so much pressure on, she had to make some big decisions and do some, some really major things with two kids and a baby inside of her wow. while I'm just gone. Yeah, I hope you gave her. I hope you gave her all that money when you got back. So <laughs> yeah, that, that was the thing is that I came home and I basically slid the cash to her and said, "Well, you know, let's buy our house." Now. Yeah. So see, yeah, it was. I'm sure it was worth it. Um, so, so you guys, so they say you're on the run and you two take off. Um, you're looking at each other. You presumably had already kind of had a conversation where you were going to head first, and you kind of. So, so what did you do first? Um, so we were there with my family, and so Beth was at, my wife. Beth was actually our getaway driver. And the plan was to basically get in the car, go south, uh, use our ATM card as fast as we could because we knew that that would give away our location. And then she passed us off to a friend of a friend of Hillmar's to take us the other direction uh, up to the northern part of Georgia. So from the very beginning, we were all about misdirection. We wanted them to think, you know, we're going south when in fact we're going north. And to kind of top it all off, before we left Hillmar's apartment, 
uh, we threw together this scheme to have his roommate basically unload all of the contents of the apartment uh, so that whenever the hunter showed up, there was nothing in Hilmar's home. Oh, that was No smart. documents, no papers, nothing that could help them get a sense of, of us and who we are um, because we wanted from the very beginning to slap them in the face. I mean, we wanted this to be a very different thing than they were accustomed to. And kind of the cherry on top of that is we left them a bottle of whiskey, two shot glasses, and a note that said, um, see you in 28 days, the Lost Wolves. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, because, I mean, That's they're awesome. used to being That's, in control. That's confidence. That, I mean, it, well, it, it's, it was forced confidence. Yeah. But that was a, a big part of being successful is you have to lie to yourself until you believe that you can actually pull it off or you get caught. Uh, and for us, that meant that we had to do some things that kind of thumbed our noses at the hunters because we wanted them to be uncomfortable. We wanted them to, f- to feel a different kind of pressure than they were accustomed to, to feeling in their day jobs because it's a, it's a different animal. It's a different creature. Did they get close ever? No. The closest they got was 28 days. No, <laughs> sorry, 12 days. It was 12 days wow. um, from their own uh, investigation. And then at the very end... Three days before we won the show, we kind of stacked these. Um, uh, we stacked these moments of uh, insulting the hunters even more, and so in the span of about two hours, we'd flown my wife in on a private jet to Georgia, met her, took a photograph with her. She posted that online. We posted six Craigslist ads uh, that included the hunter's phone numbers, their personal phone numbers, which they had made my mistake <laughs> of, of using to call my wife. And through happenstance, we had ended up connecting to her when that wasn't originally the plan. Yeah. And then uh, we also, and again, this isn't something I'm supposed to talk about, but here we are. Oh, I, I, uh, love, I love the things you're not supposed to talk we, about. We also uh, went to an ATM machine uh, which we knew would flag our location and use that to lure them to a, a farm where we had a friend come out of the, the cornfield and slash the hunter's tires <laughs> while we were disappearing <laughs> into oh the inner city of Atlanta. So much fun. Yeah, so it was a, a flurry of activity. So at that point, they were technically three days behind us. Uh, but before that, they we were, uh, I think that the, the infamous phrase used by one of the hunters is we were in the wind. Did you ever know you were, when, when were you sure you were winning? At some point you knew you won. But when we were sitting on the airplane and it was taking off on the runway. I've seen, I've seen a picture of you two holding up a lot of cash, <laughs> yeah. you know, the promotional photo. <laughs> yeah, we had to run a 5K from a bank carrying clear bags of cash in the mountains of northern Georgia. I mean, number one, you're running and you're thinking, I'm about to get shot by a hillbilly in the mountains of Georgia who's thinking that I'm like robbing a bank <laughs> and they either want the money or they want the award money for capturing us. And so like, you know, during that run, you know, the whole time you're just thinking like, keep going, keep going, keep going. Like, I got to get there. I got to get there because they could drive up the street at any given time. And so you, even though you knew you won, yeah. you weren't supposed to tell anybody you no. won. And so how long before you knew you won and it actually aired? Uh, it was... Almost a full year. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so, it was 10 months. But I'm so, a professional secret keeper. Exactly. So that's, that's what it, I do is my day it job. It wasn't as hard for you as it would have been for me, <laughs> but your, your wife knew, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And so you guys, you couldn't spend the money? I mean, did No, anybody, we didn't have the money. So they yeah. didn't give you the money no, yet? No, they, they are very, very careful with their secrets in these shows. So if you win a show and have a big paycheck coming, it does not come your way until after the finale has aired. Uh, And then they have built-in buffers, too. So it's not like, you won the show, here's your check. It's like, you won the show, okay, we're processing your check now. (laughs) Mm. And then then it starts to air. Yep. And so your friends and your family, did you have a big party the night it aired? Yeah, every every week we had all of our friends and packed into our uh, living room, and they got to see our experience firsthand. And we got to laugh and uh, kind of fill them in on the gaps in the story and, you know, the things that they didn't have time to portray in the episode. And it was it was really satisfying. That's incredible. So uh, people are just dying to know if you want or not. Oh, and yeah. that they're, was They're looking at you. Oh, man. To, I, I, every single person that I know in Jackson, Tennessee, at some point tried some kind of way to get me to like <laughs> give away yeah. one way or the other if I had one or not. Yeah. And so I had a few friends that were really persistent. And I kind of turned it into a game that uh, every time I had a conversation with them, I would leave them thinking something different than the last conversation. 
<laughs> so I would like drop these hints that we won. But then the next time we talk, I would like drop some hints like, oh man, I really wish that we could have. No, I can't talk about that. I can't talk about that. And then you know? each week it, you got closer and closer. Yeah. And so people are like looking at you thinking this really could happen. Yeah, absolutely. And then how, how uh, fun was it when it actually was announced on television, you could start talking about it again. And was that fun? Yeah, it was uh it was a pretty spectacular moment. Though it was like I do like keeping secrets. So it was kinda nice to have that secret and then for it to be everybody else's was just like a little tiny bit bittersweet, but you know, the the paycheck and the celebrations definitely uh, overclouded that tiny little bit of bit- bittersweetness. Yeah, the new house was probably a nice yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. nice prize. That's right. Um so uh Escape rooms, you're still doing mm-hmm. Jackson Escape Room. Um, what's what's next for you? Well, so we, um, we're we continuing to operate in Jackson. We own a business in Murfreesboro and then also one in Franklin and Waco, Texas. So we're continuing to, to pursue excellence in locking people in rooms for fun, the four rooms in a secret passageway model. Uh, but we're also looking for ways to expand out of that. So recently we've acquired and outfitted a, a trailer that we call Overland Escape Games that can go anywhere and everywhere. So birthday parties, factories, corporate events, and we're going to the Jackson Fair for a, a staff day coming up um, in the next couple of, uh, of weeks. And then um, we also are kind of dabbling in the world of um, making scavenger hunts cool again. Because right now the model is, you know, go and take a picture with this or, you know, go and find this piece of information. Uh, But we're taking that idea of roaming and exploring an area and coupling it with the puzzling that happens in an escape room. And we've had our first experiment with that just uh, a month ago, uh, an event called Prohibition that was all over South Jackson. And then in May, we're doing something that uh, I'm calling Secret City that's based on the history of Jackson, where you actually are going to these places that are like real cool historical things that happened in downtown Jackson, Tennessee, that's kind of all bound up in this crazy story that I've come up with. But, you know, so you get to encounter like real, the space of Jackson, the history of Jackson while having a terrific time at the same time. What's, what's the, why are you still doing business in a smaller rural, you know, we're surrounded by rural communities and yeah. what's, what's the, why not go to New York or well, you know, Orlando? There, there are places that I could go that are bigger and sexier and flashier and that I could absolutely make a lot more money. Um, but Jackson and West Tennessee gets into you. I mean, this, this place is where all of my children were born. Um, this is the only home that they've ever known, uh, and it's it's my place, you know. And I've, I've learned that through um, the church that I'm involved with downtown, called City Fellowship. I've learned that through organizations like Leadership Jackson and the Chamber that have kind of broadened my understanding of what makes Jackson Jackson. And I'm I'm here to stay. I'm not going anywhere. And Jackson's problems are my problems, and Jackson's future is my future. Uh, and I want to be right in the thick of whatever's going to happen next. So, um, yeah, there I could I could go back to Louisville. I could go back to Austin and have more cool options of places to eat and have coffee. But that's not what life's made of. Yeah, I love that. Um, it's time for us to escape now. I know you get sick of escape puns, <laughs> no doubt. Keep them coming. Keep them um, coming. So if, if anybody wants more information, they can go to jacksonescaperooms.com and they'll check out your very well done website. Thank you so much for doing this with us today. Man, it was a real pleasure. With educator Andrew Gibson, there is no escaping Discovery, but what he is sharing today from here at Discovery Park of America, I promise you wouldn't want to escape from anyway. All right. Thank you, Scott. So my name is Andrew Gibson, like he said, and I'm here with a very special guest, Russell Orr, education specialist, in-house scientist here at Discovery Park of America. And today we have a treat for you all. We're going to be talking about everyone's favorite piece of cheese, the moon. Russell, how are you doing today? Well, not as good now that you said that. (laughs) So, you know, besides it being a classic uh, Pink Floyd album, The Dark Side of the Moon, um, what all can you tell me about the moon and our listeners today? Well, first of all, we can start off with the fact that the moon is not made of cheese, nor does it have a dark side. No. No more than the earth does. Uh, the, The part of the earth that's dark, 
is experiencing night, and the part of the moon that's dark is experiencing night. It's just that the moon rotates about its axis more slowly than the Earth does, so it takes about 29 and a half days for the moon to have a day-night cycle, and we call that the phases of the moon. There is no permanently dark location on the moon, uh, unless you count some of the craters on the north and south pole, where the, we don't think that the sunlight ever really gets to, and there could be ice there, which is great, because ice is rocket fuel. Because if you have hydrogen and you have oxygen and you make them burn, you can propel a rocket. So imagine a gas station on the moon. Wouldn't that be convenient? It would be very convenient. Sure yeah. would be. Well, you know, it turns out at the bottom of some of those craters, uh, there could be rocket fuel in the, in the form of frozen water. This is why whenever... Um, Scientists say that the, the spacecraft that they're using to observe the moon or observe an asteroid, it's like petering out of fuel. What do they do? Well, they crash it into a crater on the moon. It's not because, you know, astronomers and astrophysicists really love to crash things into other stuff. There's, there's a really good reason behind it. They want to see if they can make clouds of ice and vapor come up from that crash site. Uh, in regards to uh, the moon being made of rock instead of cheese, we actually have decent ideas about what kind of rock the moon is formed from. There is similar rock on Earth as we find on the moon. Uh, and the moon is also covered in patches that were once lava. Those really dark areas on the moon, the darker grape spots, those are lunar basalt that you're seeing, which means if you were looking at the moon long enough ago at the right time, instead of the moon looking gray, it would be red-orange because that lava would still be hot. So when you're saying rocks that are similar here on Earth, mm -hmm. what kind of rocks and where would they be? Or where would, where would you find, you know, those, those rock quarries or where would you find well, things like that or those it, minerals? I would go to Hawaii because we know that the astronauts brought home lunar basalts and Hawaii, the island, is just a big old pile of basaltic lava. Um, if you've ever heard of the famous black sand beaches of Hawaii, yeah. that's because the lava, which is black, cracks and turns into sand. The reason those areas of the moon are darker is that it's also that darker colored lava up there. Uh, there's also um, anorthosite rocks on the moon, which is very, very high in feldspar, which is pale colored. So the lunar highlands and the lunar lowlands are not made of the same type of rock. And through very skilled, very exhaustive research, we've actually got pretty good ideas of what minerals are on the moon. And, and an added fact, we have some of these rocks at Discovery Park as well. We have a big piece of feldspar. We have we have basalts as well. And I always like to point at, at them when kids are here and say, "See that? That's the same kind of rock that's on the moon right there." Now, do the minerals and rocks from the moon do they ever um, flake off or come out of orbit um, and make their way down to Earth? Yes, or? we have one of them in the next room over there. Okay, we have a piece of the moon that fell onto Earth. We also have a piece of Mars. Um, every once in a while, when uh, we always see those craters on the moon, well, that stuff gets flung really, really far. And sometimes it will go into Earth's gravity well and fall down here. Uh, Earth has a very big moon for its mass. Uh, most planets have, you know, several moons. It's just that those moons are tiny compared to the size of the planet. Earth moon and Earth itself are comparatively similar in mass. Uh, you might say, well, isn't the moon, you know, much smaller than the Earth? Well, yes, but for other planets in our solar system, it's even more so. Um, another thing is Earth might have one moon, but some planets have lots of moons. Uh, Uranus, Neptune have upwards of 10 moons. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn, they have upwards of 60 moons. So the other vast number of moons you just mentioned, um, are they made of the same thing or do we know? Well, uh, some moons are covered in ice. Some moons might have oceans underneath that ice. Others are mostly just rock. Uh, there, there are some theories floating around there. Ha, see what I did there? That one of Mars's moons breaks apart and reforms every once in a while. But it's, that its its density is so low, it must have hollow spots in it. Uh, and if a moon got too close to a planet, 
then it would enter what's called the Roche radius. Remember, uh, not all the stuff in outer space is cemented together really well. Um, and that means that it could be pulled apart by a planet's gravity. Whenever that happens, the moon will get stretched out and then fall apart, and you'll have a new ring system around that planet. That's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for joining us. So for our listeners here today, you can find a piece of the moon, a piece of Mars, and a good bit of other pieces of nuggets of information here at Discovery Park of America. We thank you so much for listening. And once again, this is Andrew Gibson and Russell Orr. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.